warm welcome back to you. Uh, and for those of you joining for the first time today, don't uh, worry if you didn't come on the Medieval London tour. Uh, this, this tour is a standalone tour. Uh, but for those of you that did come on the Medieval London tour, we'll kind of make little, little links and references back to the, the Medieval London um, as well. And if you want to see the Medieval London tour, it's on our YouTube page. So I'll email that out afterwards. So Simon, we're live. Take it away. It's all yours. Excellent. Thank you once again. So uh, as you can see, my title page here is uh, Stuart London 1603 to 1714. So we've got just over 100 years to cover in a little over an hour this afternoon. That's how long we're going to be uh, exploring um, this time in London. And the tour today is brought to you in conjunction with me, of course, Simon Whitehouse, but also London Walks. And you can see the logo there on the screen. And you can see the website www.walks.com. And with London Walks, we are offering right now over 200 virtual tours on all kinds of uh, themes and subjects so that we can bring uh, the world of London to people all over the world during lockdown. So if you want to find out more about um, the tours, there's the uh, website. I'll bring it up again at the end of the presentation so you can uh, take note of it. And there are my details, uh, my email, my Twitter account and my Instagram um, if anyone would like to uh, follow me. I know some of you have followed me already, which was really nice from the last time. So thank you, those of you that followed me. And thank you to those of you that got in touch um, afterwards. And I'm sorry if I haven't replied to everybody yet, but I will do. OK, so that's the housekeeping done with. So let's introduce this period. So we're talking about London in the 17th century. And I just thought I'd bring up there a series of postage stamps that were issued just a few years ago to commemorate this particular period in British history. And this gives us all the monarchs that ruled during the period. So the first of the Stuart kings and queens was King James I. He's on the upper left-hand corner of the image. And we go then to Charles I, his son. Then Charles II, so Charles the first son and James the first's grandson. Then we go to James the second, who is the brother of Charles the second. So that's on the upper right. And then we go to, in fact, two monarchs that ruled together, William and Mary uh, on the bottom. And finally, on the right, Queen Anne, who is the sister of Queen Mary. Now, don't worry about remembering all those names. We're going to uh, join them all up on this tour today. But I thought you'd like to see all the faces of the monarchs that punctuate the story today. And by the way, interesting to note that the post office or the postal service in Britain was one of the innovations that was introduced during this particular period in British history. Although we don't get postage stamps until the middle of the 19th century. And we were the first country, by the way, just as an aside to issue postage stamps. So for that very reason, we're the only country in the world that doesn't have the country on the stamps like you do in the USA because we were the first country to have them. So we didn't need to have the country name. So that's just a little fact related to postage stamps. Anyway, let's begin by looking at this rather magnificent map. Now, this, in fact, is a map from about 1560. So this is about 40 years before our period. This is the uh, Elizabethan era. So this is Queen Elizabeth I in the Tudor period. And it's worth just mentioning that at the end of our last talk, which was the medieval London, 1485, London was already by that point the capital city. It was where the court was located. It was where the legal centre of the country was. It was the chief port. It was the entertainment centre. And it was the largest and richest city in England. And by 1603, it is the fifth or maybe the sixth largest city in Europe. But by the end of our period in 1714, it will be the second biggest city after Constantinople. Um, and the population will grow from 1603, a population of 200,000 people to 400,000 people by 1700. So, so it's, it doubles within our period, um, uh, mostly due to um, domestic immigration coming in from the rest of the country. But let's just orient ourselves uh, so we can get a sort of you know geographical sense of, uh, of where we're exploring today. So at this time, 
London, as we know it today, was divided into three distinct areas. So here's the first area. On the north bank of the river, you've got London. This is the main area. It's the walled city founded by the Romans, expanded during the medieval period. It's what we now call the city of London today. It's divided into 26 wards, subdivided into 120 parishes and headed by the Lord Mayor. So that is the main financial area where the majority of people live. In fact, that is London. OK, and it's about one square mile in area. Now, if we were to go a little bit further up the River Thames, we would come to a separate town, and this is known as Westminster. And we can see from this next image that the city here is connected to Westminster down here by this uh, long road. In fact, there's a series of roads. One is called um, uh, Cheapside, running through the city, and then we have the um, Fleet Street, then we have the Strand. And you'll notice this area is not really very developed in the late 16th century, but this area will, will develop quite significantly uh, during the 1600s. So then we come down here and this is what's known as King Street back then, it's known as Whitehall today. And this is where the Royal Palace is located, Whitehall Palace. And here is where the Palace of Westminster is located, which is the seat of government, the seat of parliament. So we've got London, we've got Westminster connected by the Strand, and then to the south of the river, linked by the only bridge that crosses over, which is here, which is London Bridge, that's again built in the 12th century, we get to this area called Southwark, and Southwark is outside of the jurisdiction of the City of London, and it's essentially a combat zone, and I describe it as the Las Vegas of London, that's where you went to have a good time in the uh, 1600s. So that's just a little bit of orientation for you. Uh, so let's introduce our first monarch of the period. So Elizabeth I died in 1603, 70 years old. She had no children and she had never married. So she was the Virgin Queen. And her Protestant cousin, who is James VI of Scotland, who is pictured here on the left-hand side, now finds himself King James I of England. So he comes down in 1603 to take over the English throne. He's married to this lady on the right. Her name is Anne of Denmark, although James is actively uh, bisexual. And this shocks, of course, Londoners. Um, and one of his favourites is this dashing young guy, George Villiers, the Duke of Buckingham. And I just like to show you that portrait just to show you what people were wearing at the time, because essentially they were still wearing what people had worn in the Tudor period, because James really wanted to foster this idea of continuity uh, going back to the end of the Tudor, so linking in. And by the way, notice the gart around his uh, calf there. Uh, men really wanted to show off their muscled calves. It was a sign of virility at the time, and uh, Villiers was a pretty virile guy, as it happens. Now, because he's King of Scotland uh, and now King of England, this is an opportunity to unite the two countries together. And indeed, uh, England and Scotland were united, and the name Great Britain was created. And James ordered that all Scottish ships um, must fly a new flag. And it's a combination of the red cross of St. George, which you can see here, and the white diagonal cross of Scotland. And this becomes known as the Union Jack. And it's flown from all Scottish and English ships. And of course, it is our national flag today. And there it is flying on the top of our parliament building on the top of the Victoria Tower. Although properly, if it's not on a ship, it's simply known as the Union flag. So that's the beginning of the Union of Scotland and England. Now, I'm gonna show you another map now, and this is a slightly different map, again, from the 16th century. Um, and it shows you uh, the north bank of the river. So there's, this, there's London, and there's the uh, St. Paul's Cathedral very different to the one that we know today, but we'll find out a bit more about that later. But here on the south bank of the river, we have Southwark. And remember, this is the entertainment district. And in the reign of Elizabeth I, Shakespeare, William Shakespeare had risen to prominence and he had made his home here at the Globe Theater. And the Lord Chamberlain's men were the premier acting troupe in London and their base was the Globe Theater. 
Now, in 1603, when Elizabeth died and James comes to the throne, James loves the theatre and he upgrades Shakespeare's company and they become known now as the King's Men. And they get a new home over on the other side of the river where you can see number seven in the area known as Blackfriars. They get a new indoor theatre. Now, this is the view of the River Thames today. And just to let sort of put this into modern context, that where the little pin is there on the right, that is where the location of the theatre was. Uh, and we can still visit it today. So what I like about doing this is, is trying to give you ideas about where you can visit when you come to London or maybe uh, when you come back to London. And there it is. It's called um, Playhouse Yard. And it's in the area known as Blackfriars. Now, no trace of the theatre exists, but we can have a little uh, image of what it looked like. There it is. And um, it was much smaller than the outdoor theatres, like the Globe. It only seated about 600 people. So tickets were actually quite expensive, whereas the open air theatres were much cheaper. And it's attracted a very exclusive crowd indeed. And if we want to get a sense of what that experience was like, going to this Jacobean theatre, that's the name we give to the period, the Jacobean period, we can, we can visit the wonderful Sam Wanamaker Theatre, which is located next to the New Globe Theatre on the South Bank. And that's the interior view of our wonderful theatre. And they put on plays from that early 17th century period. And it's lit uh, partially by beeswax candles, as it would have been back in the uh, times. So we can still have that Stuart experience today in London. Now, we're going to whiz over now to Hampton Court Palace, because there are religious problems that James has inherited from the 16th century, uh, tensions between the Catholics and the Protestants. England, of course, is a Protestant country, but um, the Catholics have not done very well under Elizabeth I. And what's, um, just sorry, to go back to that slide, is that the uh, extreme Protestants known as Puritans are hoping that this Protestant King James is going to uh, get rid of all the Catholic elements of the church, including the bishops. Um, and the Catholics are hoping that there's going to be a slightly easier time for them um, under James. Well, actually, he doesn't really end up satisfying either side, but he brings the Protestants and the Catholics to Hampton Court Palace in 16. Uh, 07 for the Hampton Court Conference to try and reconcile the two sides of the church. Um, and the tensions really come to a head in 1605 because a bunch of disaffected Catholic fundamentalists led by a man called Robert Catesby, who's pictured here on the right hand side, um, who employs an explosives expert by the name of Guido Fawkes, who's pictured here, better known to us as Guy Fawkes today. Um, they come up with a plan to um, put two and a half tons of explosives in the form of gunpowder underneath the Houses of Parliament and their plan is to blow up the King, the bishops and the Parliament um, and replace the government with a, a Catholic, Catholic rule. And part of their plan, uh, perhaps the lesser known part of that plan, is they're going to put James's younger daughter, who's only eight years old at the time, Princess Elizabeth, on the throne. And their plan is they're going to radicalise her um, to become a Roman Catholic. Um, now here is an image of the Palace of Westminster as it would have been at the time. And this arrow points to the area where in fact the barrels of gunpowder were planted. Now, one of the uh, Catholics in fact got a warning to stay away from Parliament on the 5th of November, 1605, told the authorities the cellars were searched, Guy Fawkes was discovered, the plotters were uh, hung, drawn and quartered. Uh, this has gone down in history, of course, as the gunpowder plot. Some people say that Guy Fawkes is the only man ever to have entered Parliament with honest intentions. And of course, every year in this country, we commemorate the gunpowder plot by lighting bonfires and setting off fireworks. Remember, remember the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason and plot. And it's very interesting. It had a greater resonance, of course, in the 20th century when 9-11 happened, the uh, bombing of the Twin Towers, because 9-11, you know, linked back to 5-11 in the 17th century. And it's no coincidence, by the way, that um, William Shakespeare writes 
Macbeth the following year in 1606, which is about the death of a Scottish king. And he uses the word assassination for the very first time. Now, there's also a legacy, um, apart from fireworks and bonfire night in Britain, um, that still hangs over today. Here's some fireworks. And here's the Queen going to open Parliament, as she does every single year. Well, before the Queen goes to Parliament, the cellars are still searched for barrels of gunpowder. And we actually take one of the members of Parliament hostage to Buckingham Palace and keep them there while the Queen's in Parliament. And when she's safely back at the palace, we return the Member of Parliament just in case. So it's fascinating. We still um, have these uh, modern um, uh, historical throwbacks still today. In 1607, this man on the right hand side, whose, whose statue is in the city of London uh, near St Paul's Cathedral. He's called John Smith and he's sent out to the New World and becomes the governor of the first permanent English colony in uh, the New World. It's called Jamestown and it's named after King James, of course, and that is the uh, historical site on the left that some of you, of course, will be familiar with, I'm sure, uh, Jamestown, Virginia. So the sowing the seeds there of the, um, uh, of the, uh, of the British in or the English and British in America. Now, the other thing that happens in 1611 is that King James um, produces a Bible. Uh, and this Bible is now going to be a uniform Bible, which is going to be put into all of the Protestant churches. Um, and it really was, along with Shakespeare, really, one of the two most important developments in terms of the English language. And if you think about some of the phrases we still use today, and there are so many of them, but fight the good fight from strength to strength, holier than thou, money is the root of all evil, in the twinkling of an eye, the skin of my teeth, all those phrases are contained within the King James Bible. Now, some of those Puritans are not altogether happy with what has happened in England. And in fact, some of them decide they're going to leave the country and set up a new life. This is an aerial view of an area called Rotherhithe, which is in southeast London. It's got a very long seafaring and shipbuilding history. And last year was the 400th anniversary of the departure of that ship, of course, the Mayflower. And I've put a little pin here because right here is the location, or very close to the location, where the ship departed from. And here it is. You can visit the Mayflower pub still today. It's a beautiful 16th century pub right on the river. And in fact, um, you, there's a book. And you can, uh, if you're researching your history and you want to know if your ancestors were on the Mayflower, um, you can actually um, find out a little bit more about it in the Mayflower pub. And um, the the captain of the Mayflower was a man called Christopher Jones, and him and many of the crew were local men from the area. And this is the church just across from the Mayflower pub, where in fact he's buried. When he came back from the voyage, of course, a very uh, difficult voyage, as we know, but he was buried here. And that uh, statue was put up just a few years ago, uh, and it commemorates the journey. And you can see there's, a, there's a, an image of somebody looking back towards the old world, back to England, and this new baby looking towards the, the new world. So Mayflower Pub, put it on your list to visit when you come. Right. Now, in 1616, there is a revolution in architecture in England. And it's all thanks to this man. This is Inigo Jones. And he was, in fact, a theatrical set designer initially, but he also went on to become really the first classical architect in England. And well, there are many, there are many buildings that survive, but two really great examples are this one. And this is called the Queen's House. And this is located in Greenwich, just five miles from the city of London, another wonderful place to visit. And look at it, it is a perfect double cube. And it was the first building that really uh, was deemed a classical building. And it was influenced by the ideals of a, a Renaissance architect called Andrea Palladio. And it was really quite extraordinary. Um, it was actually built as a result of a row between James I and his wife, um, Anne of Denmark, probably getting fed up with all those boys he was playing around with. Um, but in fact, he shot one of her hunting dogs uh, during a hunt and he swore very loudly and uh, very vociferously at her and she wouldn't speak to him for days. And to make it up to her, he said, what can I do for you? And 
she says, right, I'd like a nice country house, please. And remember, uh, Greenwich was, of course, really open countryside at the time. So the Queen's house was built for Queen Anne of Denmark. Now, the other building that still survives today is on Whitehall. And this is 1619. And this building here is the Banqueting House. And it was built for a Whitehall Palace, which was the main seat of the royal family at the time. It's the only building that survives from the palace, which sadly burnt down in 1698. But again, it was absolutely revolutionary in terms of its classical style with those beautiful pilasters going sort of up the side there, uh, these beautiful uh, swags uh, on, on the top there. And also it was the first building in London to be built out of a a uh, new type of white stone called Portland stone. And you see Portland stone all over London quarried from the south coast of England. And you'll notice, by the way, here just to the left um, is a building that looks very similar. And that's another government building on Whitehall. But that's actually a late 19th century building. But it's just to show you that the classical architecture that Inigo Jones established in the 17th century influenced people for generations. Actually, he designed 49 buildings, only seven survive, largely because he was overshadowed by the great Sir Christopher Wren later on in the 17th century. Now, James I died in 1625, and he was succeeded by his second son, Charles Stuart, who became Charles I. And here's a portrait of Charles I. Now, Charles I was the shortest king we've ever had. Um, he was only five feet, four inches in height. Uh, and he had, gave him a bit of a complex, actually. Not that you would know it from this portrait, because he was very clever. He used artists and art in a very big way to um, really, as, as a publicity exercise. And every time he was painted, he was usually painted on horseback to elevate his height. Um, he was extremely cultured. He was a great art collector. He collected art by Titian and by Raphael and by Holbein. But this portrait was painted by this man, Anthony van Dyck. And Anthony van Dyck came over from what is now the Netherlands. He was appointed the court painter of King Charles the first. And he was the pupil of another great Flemish artist, perhaps the greatest, Peter Paul Rubens. And King Charles commissioned Rubens to do a little bit of interior decorating back over at the banqueting house. Rubens decorated the ceiling. And here it is. We'll go inside and have a look. That's the ceiling of the banqueting house. And what Charles had put there was an image of his dead dad, James, in the middle of the ceiling, um, surrounded by all the mythological gods and goddesses. And the idea was to reinforce the idea that James and Charles uh, believed in the divine right of kings. The idea that the kings were appointed by God to rule over the earth and nothing could take that away from them. Now, this is a problem because it will lead ultimately to King Charles I's downfall. Here's a close up of the ceiling. It's at, so that's James I. It's called the apotheosis of James I. And Rubens described Charles I as the greatest amateur of painting amongst the princes of the world. Um, now, we nearly lost the art collection during the Civil War, which we'll talk about in a minute, but most of the paintings were recovered during the restoration, which we'll be talking about later. Um, and if you visit, um, you can visit the banqueting house uh, when it opens again, of course, you can visit Hampton Court Palace, you can visit Windsor Castle, and all of those buildings contain some of the great treasures of Charles I's art collection. Now, I said that we were going to have a little bit of uh, development going on in London, in terms of, uh, you know, building development. And this man is the Duke of Bedford. And in 1630, he paid 2,000 pounds, which would be about a quarter of a million British pounds today, to get permission to build new houses, in fact, a purpose-built housing development, really, on the site of what had been the old um, convent belonging to Westminster Abbey, um, known as Convent Garden. And the man that he appoints to design the development is this man. This is Inigo Jones, we've met him before, haven't we? So Inigo Jones was appointed as the architect. And here is an image of uh, the square in a 
about 1660. Now, uh, the square, we'd, ne we'd never had a, a planned square before in London, so that was a revolution in itself. Again, very much influenced by Italian classical architecture. And you can just see on the right here, one of the three blocks of Italian style townhouses that were built. And all the streets were named after um, Charles I's family, including his wife, Henrietta Marais. If you go to what is now Covent Garden today, of course, look up at the street signs because uh, we've got King Street, James Street, Henrietta Street, all named after the uh, Stuart monarchs. Now, the other stipulation was that as well as the houses being built, a church has to be built. And this building here is the church that Inigo Jones designed, and it's known as St Paul's Church Covent Garden. And it's the only building in Covent Garden that still survives today from the period, from the 1630s. The other thing I want you to notice is just here on the left-hand side, this is a hackney carriage. Um, and this is the beginning of what we know as black taxis today in London. Um, so, so this form of public transport starts in the 1630s. 40s. Uh, hack, and we still call uh, the taxi drivers hackney carriage drivers today. Now we're going to come back to Covent Garden a little bit later because this area is going to develop again um, in about 30 years time when a fruit and vegetable market is going to be built in the middle of this great big open space. Okay. Um, now in 1642, um, King Charles I does something which changes the course of English history forever. He's had a big falling out with um, Parliament because he wants to raise taxes to fight quite expensive wars with France and Parliament refuse to agree to it. So what does King do? Remember, divine right of kings. Right, I'm going to close Parliament down. I'm not going to uh, uh, ask for Parliament's consent. I'll, I'll raise the money through other means. And so Parliament actually didn't sit for 11 years from 1629 to 1642. And a, a rebellion essentially starts in Parliament. And um, uh, uh, this is actually an image of the House of Lords today. So one of the two, uh, the upper chamber of the Houses of Parliament. Um, and I show you that for a reason which I'll explain. But um, King Charles I enters the House of Commons to actually arrest five members of Parliament for high treason. So just imagine that the king actually going in to arrest five members of Parliament. And what happens is that the Speaker of the House of Commons refuses to help the king and says, I'm a servant of Parliament, not the king. And the king had to leave unable to arrest the five members of parliament. Now, this is really important because it established the right of the House of Commons to govern itself rather than take orders from the king. And as a result of that, no monarch has ever been allowed to enter the House of Commons since then. And that's why here you see the queen in the next stage of the state opening of parliament sitting in the House of Lords. She's not permitted to enter the House of Commons as a result of King Charles I's action. So we still have that hangover today. And this action of King Charles leads to um, what we describe or later described as the Civil War. You're now seeing a, a photograph of the Tower of London, of course, which again, we talked about in the medieval period. What happens is the king flees the capital, he goes to Oxford and he sets up a rival capital there, raises the royal flag, the royal standard and declares war, effectively declares war on his own people. By the way, as soon as the flag was raised, um, it was blown over by a gust of wind. And I think that gives you a pretty good idea about what's going to happen to poor old King Charles. But what happens in London is that London sides with the parliamentary forces against the king. And the leader of the parliamentary army, a man called Oliver Cromwell, uh, takes over the Tower of London and it becomes a military garrison. Now, as William the Conqueror found out in the 11th century, if you control the Tower of London, you basically control the entire country. And the occupation of the Tower was really one of the reasons that the parliamentarians won the Civil War. So the country was split down the middle, and this is just a very uh, simple uh, explanation of what happens. Uh, the king's supporters are known as the Cavaliers from the French Chevalier for knight. Um, and you can see there, that's the, that's the laughing cavalier, uh, the portrait of which we have in the 
Wallace collection in London, uh, although he was a Dutch uh, merchant, but it gives you the, the, the idea what they look like. And the parliamentarians were known as the roundheads uh, simply because they had pudding basin haircuts. Um, and the country really was divided down the middle. Entire families were divided. Um, you know, perhaps, you know, we're experiencing that a little bit in the last few years with, you know, Brexit and, you know, in the US, there's been a lot of division recently. So I think we can sort of understand that whole idea of, you know, a country being split down the middle. And this is a map of, um, well, England and Scotland, but just showing you the fact that the uh, the Royalists occupied mostly the area to the southwest of England and uh, Wales to the west. But you can see that the parliamentarians occupied mostly the south, uh, well, the south and the north and the southeast. So that's really what gave them an advantage. They also had access to the, um, the, the coast, of course, which was obviously very, very important. Now, in London, what happens is that London barricades itself uh, for fear that King Charles is going to invade. And this is a map of the defences that were built during the Civil War. The king actually attempted to invade London with his cavalier army, but within weeks, um, 18 miles of earth ramparts were built right around the perimeter of the uh, city. Trenches were dug and 24 forts were built. Um, and they stretched all the way from the Tower of London, which you can see there, all the way north, right the way along what is now Oxford Street, all the way down to Hyde Park Corner, and all the way virtually down towards where Westminster Abbey is. And everybody got involved, thousands and thousands of Londoners, um, you know, shoemakers, oyster sellers, even noble ladies got involved. They picked up shovels, they dug trenches just to keep Charles I out of the city. And this is a close up here um, of um, uh, an area known as Mayfair, which many of you will know. And the reason I show you that is because number 14 um, effectively still survives. We can still see it. Um, this beautiful art gardens, are, these are called Mount Street Gardens. And uh, this was Oliver's Mount, it was known as. And you can still just about see a little bit of the outline of what would have been one of the forts. Uh, today, it's a very beautiful, restful garden for you to sit in and enjoy. But it's just a little legacy from the Civil War. Now, it all ends rather badly for King Charles I. Uh, without going into the whole story of the Civil War, he was um, eventually arrested in 1649. And he was put on trial in the House of Commons. And he was found guilty of tyranny, treason against his own people. And we're back to the banqueting house on Whitehall. Why are we here? Because on January the 30th, 1649, the king is led from St. James's Palace into the banqueting house. He walks under the ceiling, the one that he'd had painted by Rubens, looks up at his dad on the ceiling, and steps out onto the first floor balcony. And if you go and visit the banqueting house today, there is a bust of Charles I, and that's approximately where he walked out to on that fateful day. And this is an image of the execution of Charles I outside the banqueting house. Normally, if you're a traitor, you were beheaded near the Tower of London, but Cromwell was terribly worried that um, if the king was taken through the city all the way to the tower, there might have been a rebellion. So uh, this was a, a much better location. So he was beheaded with the axe and the shortest king in English history was now a foot shorter as a result. It was the first time that a king had been killed by his own people and nobody cheered and many people wept openly at the event. This is the shirt that we believe Charles I wore at his execution. In fact, the day of the execution was January the 30th, very cold day, and the king wore two shirts. He wore two shirts because he didn't want the crowd to think that he was shivering with fear. So we've got no king, and for the first time in our history, we become a republic for 11 years. And the leader of the republic is this man, this is Oliver Cromwell, the leader of the parliamentary army. Amazingly, he was voted in a poll about 10 years ago as one of the 10th in the top 10 greatest Britons of all time. And he is a Protestant, an extreme one, a Puritan. And although he does run the country with parliament for the first few years, eventually he starts acting very much like a monarch and he dismisses parliament and becomes the Lord Protector and effectively rules like a military dictator for five years. And life under Cromwell is not much fun. He closes down all the playhouses, um, 
any form of entertainment. The pubs were closed. Um, May Maypoles were pulled down. Dancing in public was banned. Um, and even in 1653, uh, he bans Christmas. In fact, Christmas and Easter were cancelled because these were not mentioned in the Bible and therefore uh, they should not be observed. And soldiers were raiding people's houses to take away people's Christmas dinners. Imagine that in England. Um, now, I don't want you to think it was all bad under Cromwell because um, in fact, he does allow opera to be uh, brought to England. And we have women singers on the English stage before women are allowed to act in plays. And in 1655, very importantly, the Jewish, uh, Jewish people were invited back to England having been expelled, if you remember, in 1290 by King Edward I, uh, mainly because Cromwell needed uh, Jewish financiers. But 400 Sephardic Jews were settled in the area known as Bevis Marks today, and a synagogue was built, and it's still there today, very much part of the Jewish story of London. But in, oh, and by the way, um, I couldn't help but bring in that image of the Grinch that stole Christmas, because, uh, you know, Cromwell really is the original Grinch. In 1658, he died. His son Richard took over for a bit, but he was uh, he didn't know how to control Parliament or the army, and there was a power vacuum. No one could work out the country uh, how to run the country without a king. So guess what? Parliament invite the monarchy to come back, and in 1660 couldn't resist but put this image up: the return of the king in 1660. And who is the king? Well. He's the son of King Charles I. He is King Charles II. And here's his coronation portrait. It was the biggest comeback in history. He restores the monarchy, and this period now is known as the Restoration Period. Now, look at him. He was um, six foot tall, so very different to his dad. Um, he was extremely flamboyant. Um, and he did have what we would call star quality today. And you'll notice he's holding an orb and a scepter, so a, a, a sort of gold ball on the right and a, a gold stick on the left. He's wearing fabulous uh, shoes and full makeup, by the way. And notice the long hair, it's actually a wig, and I'll talk about wigs in a minute. Um, the problem was when he came to be crowned in Westminster Abbey in 1661, he'd actually got nothing to wear because Oliver Cromwell, had melted down the medieval crown jewels. So one of the first things that Charles II has to do is have a new set of crown jewels made. And here we can see the crown of St. Edward the Confessor. We can see the orb and we can see the scepter. Now, all those were made in 1661, along with uh, about 100 other items at a cost of 12,000 pounds. Now, the king had no money, so parliament had to pay. And still today, that's why the state owns the crown jewels in Britain, not the monarch. Uh, over half the items in the 200 strong collection of the crown jewels, which you can of course see at the Tower of London, date to this period. So the orb and the scepter and the crown were worn by Queen Elizabeth II in 1953. Um, and who knows, they might be worn by King Charles III whenever that day comes along. Charles II wanted to take revenge on the men that were responsible for his father's execution. Oliver Cromwell had died, if you remember, in 1658 and had himself buried in Westminster Abbey, just like, you know, all the other kings and queens. And that's his death mask, Oliver Cromwell's death mask on the right hand side. Um, in 1661, Charles II decided to dig up all of the people, including Oliver Cromwell, who had been responsible for his father's execution. Uh, and the ones that were still alive, he had those arrested and um, uh, rounded up. And they were all put on trial, um, about 200 of them. And they were all found guilty of regicide, the killing of a king. So imagine Oliver Cromwell, was um, his dead corpse was taken to what is now Marble Arch at the western end of Oxford Street. He was, um, they, they, were, they were actually given a trial, but you know, their defense was pretty lacking given that they were dead. Um, and so, but they were found guilty of regicides and he was beheaded. We think his head possibly survives um, in his old college in Cambridge. Um, but actually for the first 30 years, the head was 
displayed on a spike on the top of the Parliament building. So ironically, the man that had done so much to further the cause of Parliament had his head on the roof of the building for about 30 years, and then it fell off during a thunderstorm. And nobody's really quite sure what happened to it, but you can see the image there on the left of um, the executions. And there is today a statue outside the Houses of Parliament that was erected in the late 19th century um, to commemorate Oliver Cromwell. As it happens, across the road from the Houses of Parliament, uh, in a little niche, is the bust of the head of Charles I. So these two great enemies are staring across the road from each other. Now, Charles II, having dis uh, dealt with, with the regicides, um, is very interested in all sorts of things. And one of the things he's really interested in is what we now call science, what they then called back then natural philosophy. And I just wanted to show you this because on the 28th of November, 1660, um, what became known as the Royal Society was set up. Now, this is um, a, an aerial view of the modern day city of London today. And this building on the right is the cheese grater, one of our very modern skyscrapers. This building here is the NatWest Tower, which was is a bank that was built in the 1980s, although it's not a bank anymore. Um, and at the foot of the where the NatWest Tower is, that's where the Royal Society was established. It was actually set up in the former home of, a, of an Elizabethan merchant called Thomas Gresham. And these men, um, including um, Sir Christopher Wren, who would go on, of course, to transform London um, in the next few years, uh, was one of the members. This man is Robert Hook, who was a biologist. This man is Robert Boyle, who was a chemist. And this man on the left is Isaac Newton, who, of course, was the father of modern physics. Um, and lectures were held at the Royal Society, and it's still today the oldest scientific institution anywhere in the world. Um, so that's really an amazing, um, I think, foundation at the time. Notice, by the way, they're all wearing those same long um, wigs that we saw with Charles II. Now, this this was the wigs were brought over by Charles II from France. Uh, Louis XIV, uh, who he'd been in exile with during the Civil War, had started the fashion for um, full-bottomed wigs. And um, they remained very fashionable for men right up until the early 18th century. And then they got uh, shorter and shorter. But any portraits you look of people at the time of men, they're all wearing those full-bottomed wigs. Um, sometimes during duels, by the way, during, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, or, or sword fights between men, um, men would get the tip of the sword and they would try and pull um, the hair uh, or the wig down over the eyes of their opponent. And some of the wigs were made from human hair, but some of them were, were made from, um, you know, wool. And the expression, pulling the wool over somebody's eyes, we believe comes from that period. Now, the other thing that Charles II is uh, really keen on is the theatre. And if you remember, the theatres had been closed by Oliver Cromwell. But in 1662, Charles II establishes or re-establishes uh, the theatre. And this building today is the Theatre Royal Drury Lane. It's right in the heart of Covent Garden. And although this building dates to 1812, this is the fourth theatre on the site. And the first theatre was built on that site in 1662. The theatre, well, it was actually called the King's Theatre, but it was the birth of what we would now describe as the West End theatre culture. Something else that Charles II introduced to the stage, which had never been seen before in England, women. Margaret Hughes on the left-hand side was the first actress that we know of officially to appear on the stage, but the most famous actress was there on the right-hand side. Her name is Nell Gwynne, and she went on to become the most famous actress of the Restoration period. And she becomes even more famous because she becomes the mistress of King Charles II. Now, King Charles II was a serial philanderer. Uh, he had about a dozen mistresses and almost as many children by those mistresses. His wife... Um, um, Catherine of Braganza was not able to have any children, sadly. So, uh, so he really was, um, uh, you know, a sex addict, really. And Nell Gwynne became his most beloved mistress. And we have two pubs dedicated to Nell Gwynne um, in in that neighbourhood today. So uh, they're worth popping into. Now, another serial philanderer who became a, a close buddy of 
King Charles II was this man, and this man is Samuel Pepys. And Samuel Pepys um, is there in, again, his wig and his lovely Indian gown. And he was born just off Fleet Street. Um, amazing, really, life story. He, he witnessed the execution of Charles I. He was on the boat that went out to bring Charles II back to England during the uh, Restoration. And he did very, very well indeed. And he rose uh, and became the secretary of the Navy Board, which was essentially, um, you know, a bit like being, you know, the senior government minister today in charge of uh, the ships. And, and he completely transformed the Navy. Um, but what he's most famous for is between 1660 and 1669, nearly 10 years, he wrote and kept a diary. And that's an image of his diary on the right hand side. He wrote mostly in code and in COD Spanish and French. Um, but he gave us not just the accounts of the big stuff that happens in that 10 year period, the Great Plague and the Great Fire, which we're going to come to, but actually incredible details about daily life, including, I might say, his own sexual shenanigans. No wonder he wrote it in code to keep it uh, from his wife's eyes. Um, and really, Pepys would be sort of, I suppose, the Harvey Weinstein, really, of the 17th century. But he was the first modern diarist. And it's the first time, really, that a personal diary is written in this way. Um, and it wasn't actually translated until the 19th century. So had he been around in the early days of Twitter, um, you know, he'd have been the first person uh, tweeting. And uh, uh, something else just to show you is uh, the horrors of medicine, of course, at the time. Um, this is an operation that was very common in the 17th century. And it's something that Samuel Pepys experienced himself at the age of 25. This is a lithotomy. Um, the diet was very, very heavy in meat. Um, and as a result, people got excess buildup of protein in their system. And this resulted in kidney stones and bladder stones. Samuel Pepys ended up with a bladder stone that was um, the size of what was effectively a small tennis ball. Now, just imagine that pressing on your bladder, gentlemen. Ouch. Um, and uh, you either died from uh, infection or from, you know, the sheer pain, or you underwent this operation. Uh, and this is a lithotomy. And what they did basically is they cut uh, an incision from just under your scrotum all the way down to the top of your backside um, and uh, put the hand in and removed the offending um, stone. And amazingly, Samuel Pepys survived the operation. And he was so proud of having survived it without anaesthetic, without antiseptic, that he had the kidney stone put in a bowl in the corner of his dining room. And every year he invited friends round to celebrate what he termed his second birthday because he'd survived. So that's a little bit about 17th century surgery. The next thing I want to tell you about is the development of, of, the, of the square. Now we've talked about Covent Garden, which was the first square, but what happens is in the early 1660s is that this square was developed and this is St. James's Square. Now this, was lo this is located very close to St. James's Palace, which is where King Charles II had taken up residence. Um, and basically, he gave land to a man called the Earl of St. Albans uh, to build or to sublet plots of land around the square. Builders built the buildings, sublet them um, out to, or sorry, sold the buildings on to wealthy um, uh, uh, purchasers. Um, who turned out to be, in fact, dukes and earls mostly. So what this becomes is an aristocratic enclave, just a few minutes walk away from St. James's Palace. And St. James's Square, still very beautiful today to wander around, um, one of the earliest squares. And actually, it forms a pattern because what happens is the squares then start to um, further westwards and we get Soho Squings with which you may be familiar. Okay, um, in 1665, um, disaster strikes because we get the outbreak of a terrible disease, something with which of course Londoners are familiar, um, but this is uh, the biggest one that they've seen in many years. Uh, it's called the Great Plague. Here's a map of the city um, in yellow. Here's a map of the outlying wards of the city, so just the areas outside the city wall. But just over here, where the little red dot is, is where the plague broke out. So it actually broke out in effectively what is now Covent Garden um, in early 1665. 
here's an image of the area today. So actually, it's roughly where Seven Dials is. Um, and a little girl was the first official victim of the Great Plague. Um, as soon as plague broke out, uh, houses were ordered to be sealed up. Uh, many people um, saw this as an attack on their civil liberties, something, of course, we're probably familiar with that at the moment. Um, and um, the people in Covent Garden, which uh, is in fact just down here, remember, very wealthy residential district, um, they actually board up their houses and uh, escape out to the countryside. And that's what most wealthy people did during the plague. They hightailed it out of London and left the poor to it. Um, and this is an image of just uh, what people did. Uh, red crosses were painted on the doors of people's houses uh, to try and, you know, contain the plague. Um, women were sent out called searchers. There's one there with a lantern and they were looking for people that had symptoms of the plague, usually these terrible swellings underneath their armpits called buboes, uh, which is why we called it bubonic plague. And if a, if a victim was found in a house, the house was boarded up, nailed up, and um, a cross was put on the door saying, Lord have mercy on their souls. So imagine being boarded up with your nearest and dearest in a house. Um, you know, we've all experienced that during lockdown. Uh, and of course, most people would have died um, within a few days of the disease. Now, um, we could go on and on about the Great Plague because, but it's, re it's really a separate um, tour in itself. But they, they recorded the deaths on a week by week basis in these things called the bills of mortality. And again, we're familiar with that at the moment, aren't we? You know, the numbers of deaths being recorded on a daily basis. But it gives us a good idea as to what people died from um, at this time. Now, you can see plague here uh, on this one. Um, 6,544 deaths. Um, that's just in one week, and I think that's in September of 1665. So at the height of the plague, six, 7,000 people were dying every single week. Um, but this was an anomaly because you can see that uh, people died of all kinds of things. And one of the things, the most common things that people died from was teeth, teeth because of course there was no dentistry as we know it today and infections from uh, rotting teeth or cavities led to septicemia and a lot of people died from tooth infections. Um, they did all kinds of things to try and combat the plague um, and the beaked helmet on the left hand side was one of the, the most terrifying images. Um, and uh, I guess that they were like masks really that we're wearing at the moment uh, for plague doctors and it would be stuffed with sweet smelling herbs um, in a bid to ward off the foul odours because they believe the plague was spread by the bad air. Um, they didn't understand of course that it was spread by a bacteria brought over on uh, the backs of black rats and sp spread by fleas. Uh, I just thought I'd show you a, you know, a, a mask today because you know, we're, we're kind of you know, familiar with what that's like at the moment. Uh, and, we, and we know a lot about, um, we have first-hand accounts of the plague thanks to Samuel Pepys's diary. By the end, or actually by the beginning of 1666, uh, during the winter, the plague had abated, but officially 67,000 people had died in London of the Great Plague, um, although now we think probably closer to 100,000 people actually died. That would be a quarter of the population of 400,000 people at the time. And just a few years ago, we were excavating near Liverpool Street Station, um, building our crossrail, which is our new transportation infrastructure, although it's not finished yet. Um, and uh, they found 5,000 bodies buried um, on the site of what was formerly a lunatic asylum. Um, and so the, these were victims of the Great Plague from 1665. Six months later, as if the Great Plague wasn't bad enough, another great thing emerges, erupts, and that's September the 2nd, 1666. A great fire starts. Well, it wasn't a great fire to begin with. It was actually a very small fire. And it breaks out here on Pudding Lane, uh, right in the heart of the city, in a baker's shop. Um, and within about two hours of the fire being um, alerted, the Lord Mayor is brought out to witness some of the houses on fire. And um, the Lord Mayor makes a very famous statement. It's gone down in history. It's one of the most famous statements in English history. And um, he didn't think it was a very big fire at all. It was nothing to worry about. And in fact, he said a woman could piss it out. That's what he said, the Lord Mayor, a woman could piss it out. Well, in fact, it turned out to be a very great fire indeed. And um, the fire within the first few hours actually spread all the way along here, 
over towards the Tower of London, and it started to spread onto the bridge. Remember, the only bridge across the river packed with uh, wooden buildings um, and uh, shops and so on. And of course, um, the majority of the buildings in the city of London were timber framed with thatched roofs. And of course, the streets were very narrow, they were very congested, and this enabled the fire to spread um, extremely quickly, helped also by a very strong east wind, uh, which started to whip up on the Monday. Now, again, without going into the whole story of the Great Fire, um, four days later, this gives you an idea of where the fire had spread. So there's Sunday, Monday, by Tuesday and Wednesday, the fire had engulfed all of the um, city of London and it had uh, reached here uh, over to the west, about halfway along Fleet Street, heading towards Westminster. But in fact, the rains came and the wind died down and that's largely why the Great Fire was able to now be controlled. Um, I just thought I'd show you this because this shows you an image of modern London with our modern skyscrapers, you know, the, the Gherkin and, and um, St Paul's Cathedral there, the Barbican, and that just puts that into, in, imagine today if, if, if the fire engulfed the modern city. Um, absolutely extraordinary. Um, this is a map of London after the fire. So that area is the area that was uh, destroyed. Just to give you the statistics, um, 373 out of 448 acres of the city were destroyed, um, plus another 60 acres just outside of the walled area. 87 out of 109 churches were damaged or destroyed beyond repair. Um, the estimates today would, uh, the estimates then were about 10 million pounds in damage. So that would be, you know, I mean, billions today. Um, 70,000 out of 80,000 residents lost their homes. Um, and these are, this area of London, Moorfields to the north of the city wall became effectively a refugee camp, actually for months and months and months after the fire ended. Uh, yet officially, they tell us only six to 12 people died. That hardly seems possible. We think now that many of the bodies were literally incinerated um, and just mixed in with all of the ashes of the fire. So probably, in reality, hundreds of people died. Um, but there's a really point, big point to be made about the Great Fire, because as the diarist John Evelyn said, London was but is no more. And it marked the end, really, of medieval London. Up until that point, London was still largely a medieval city. And there was an opportunity now to rebuild, to start all over again. Within a week, two men had submitted plans for the new city. Um, and um, this map was issued by a man called John Evelyn, who was another writer, a diarist of the time. This map was issued by Sir Christopher Wren. And you can see that, in fact, they are similar in concept. They wanted to sweep away the old, windy, windy medieval streets, create effectively a grid system with streets going north to south and streets going east to west with boulevards, churches in the middle. Wren's idea was really to recreate ancient Rome. Um, on the site of the fire ravaged city. As it happened, all of these plans came to naught because the problem was they had to rebuild extremely quickly. They had to rehouse people. Um, there were lots of issues, lots of disputes with landowners um, who did not want um, their land uh, taken over. And so what effectively happens is that the city was rebuilt, but on the existing medieval street plan. So part of the charm of the city of London today is we still have these lovely windy, windy streets, but um, built you know, on the old medieval street plan. Now, I don't know uh, too much about this, but maybe uh, people in Washington DC, maybe uh, experts will know this, but my, one of my understandings is that Wren's plan for the city of London that never came to fruition was in fact um, adopted, or at least it inspired, I understand, the layout of Washington DC uh, in the 18th century. So maybe somebody can tell us a bit more about that later. Um, but one of the big um, changes was that, um, building regulations changed. And um, in 1667, a building act was introduced. No buildings now from um, timber, no thatched roofs. Everything must be built out of brick, stone with tiled roofs. And amazingly, the city was rebuilt within about four years. And you can see here um, that uh, the, the regulations um, allow only buildings of certain heights, depending on the width of 
the street. Um, now, I've put an image of the Globe Theatre there, which is the new Globe Theatre built in the 1990s um, on the south bank of the river. Now, why have I put that there? Because when they were building the Globe, rebuilding the Globe, they wanted to build it in accordance with the Elizabethan building techniques, timber and thatch. And because this law, which was still in force, did not allow timber buildings to be built within three miles of the city of London, the authorities had to fight for eight years to get uh, permission to build the new Globe Theatre. But it is an authentic, um, or as far as possible, an authentic Elizabethan building. Um, but there are little sprinklers on the top of the thatched roof at the Globe. Um, so I always think that's a nice little uh, echo, again, of, of those rules. There's a wonderful image of London. That's, that's actually 1720. Um, one of the great buildings, of course, destroyed in the fire was the old St. Paul's Cathedral, the medieval Gothic building. Um, and remember, 89 other churches destroyed. Well, um, 51 churches out of 89 were rebuilt. Um, and St. Paul's was rebuilt here in the classical Baroque style by Sir Christopher Wren. It actually took 35 years to build, starting in 1675. Um, and we'll kind of finish with a little image of it in a few minutes. But it's worth noting that up until the 1960s, the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral was the uh, tallest building in the city of London. But you can see how the, the landscape was completely transformed um, as a result of the fire. Now, some people say that the Great Fire um, was the reason that after 1666, there were no further plagues in London, no pandemics. Well you know, slightly different pandemic today. But um, this, uh, that's not quite true because that's the area that was um, uh, the, the, the fire destroyed, but that's the area where the plague reached. So the plague actually reached a far greater area than the fire did. So that kind of dispels the myth that the, um, the, that the fire um, cleansed London of the plague. We don't really know why the plague has never resurfaced since, uh, although there are theories about that now, but um, but that's a bit of a myth. Now, other things start to happen. A lovely new street is laid out uh, in front of St. James's Palace. This is St. James's Palace there on the right-hand side. A very lovely wide street. It's called Pall Mall. Now, it's still there. It's also a brand of cigarettes. But Pall Mall was actually a game that was brought over by Charles II from France, and it was a bit of a mix of croquet and golf um, and you can see it here so people literally had to use mallets to hit balls to try and get them through these hoops and the game was called Pai Mai. Now the English couldn't pronounce you know that so it became known as Pal Mal but this is what the street was used for. It was used for playing this this game of croquet uh, and we still call the street Pal Mal today. The other thing that Charles II had done um, was open up the royal parkland for the public. This is a lovely image of St. James's Park. Um, this is an image of Charles II's family. Um, and the king would often walk through the park and be seen by his, uh, by his public. Um, and these little spaniels, of course, um, are his favourite dogs. And they become known as King Charles Spaniels, which I always think is lovely. Um, and these are pelicans, which we can still see today in St. James's Park. They're fed every day at three o'clock. And they were introduced by the Russian ambassador in 1662 to St. James's Park, a gift to King Charles II. In 1670, King Charles issues a license for a market to be built on the site of that very fashionable development, Covent Garden. Initially, they start to trade just in the middle of the square. There's the church, if you remember from earlier. If we visit Covent Garden today, we have covered market buildings and the market was still there until 1974 and then it moved to another location. But this building today houses, of course, the lovely shops and restaurants and the church of Inigo Jones is still there, look, in the heart of Covent Garden today. 1683, put on your extra layers because we have um, a very cold winter indeed and the River Thames used to freeze regularly, but it was the coldest winter on record in 1684. We have a mini ice age and the entire river froze over and this is people partying on the river, which lasted about six weeks. Food stalls, entertainment, all kinds of things. Now, we're also at war with the Dutch in, in the 1660s um, and King Charles 
the second is well aware that we've got all these soldiers coming back from these Dutch wars um, and many of them are destitute and many of them are um, disabled and he gets Christopher Wren to build a hospital where the old soldiers can be rehabilitated and it's still there today. This is the Royal Hospital Chelsea in the southwest part of London and um, it was designed by Sir Christopher Wren uh, just on the river there and amazingly 300 uh, old soldiers still call it home today and they are known as the Chelsea pensioners and there they are in their uniforms on the right hand side the same uniforms from the 17th century and a few years ago they even allowed women to join as well so there are two of the i think 10 of 10 women out of 350 um retirees that live at the royal hospital today um very quickly this is an image of a coffee house because in the 1650s coffee arrives in england so quite a few years before starbucks um it was a penny a cup and men gathered in these coffee houses to uh discuss politics uh, to discuss science this is where you know robert hook and christopher Wren are all hanging out um you can pick up very early forms of newspaper um if you're impatient and you don't want to have to wait too long for your coffee um you can uh, there's a little box on the counter and on the front it says to ensure promptness t-i-p um and we think that's where the origin of giving a tip comes from to ensure promptness women weren't allowed in the coffee houses quite understandably they set up a petition against coffee and they accused coffee of in fact coffee beans making men sterile and impotent um and um king charles ii who definitely wasn't impotent was very worried that the coffee shops might be places where his enemies might conspire against him so he used the women's petition to try and close down the coffee shops uh, but in fact it didn't work and um popular protest kept them open by 1700 there are 500 coffee houses in london uh the beginning of the coffee revolution we're back to the modern city today because this is an image of a very modern building in the city. It's called Lloyd's of London and it was built in 1986. Lloyd's of London is the world's largest insurance market, but it started out in 1688. Edward Lloyd set up a coffee shop and he got ship owners to come in to meet the bankers and the bankers would insure ships voyages um, at sea. And this is the beginning of marine insurance. Um, and um, the building um, rather looks like a stainless steel coffee machine from the outside today. Uh, so Lloyd's of London was born out of the coffee shops, amongst other things. This is um, James II. Now, James II was the brother of Charles II. Charles II died after 25 years on the throne in 1685. He'd had no legitimate children. Remember, his wife couldn't have any, so his brother takes over. But he doesn't last very long because James II is an out and proud Roman Catholic. Um, and after all the upheaval with the Catholics in the 16th century and all the trouble we've had in the 17th century with Guy Fawkes, um, Parliament decided to overthrow the king. And in fact, Charles, uh, James II's daughter, Mary, has married a Dutch Protestant prince called William of Orange. And in 1688, James II is overthrown and William and Mary uh, are invited over from the Netherlands to take over the throne. And they rule jointly together as joint monarchs, the first and only time that's ever happened in British history. And because they're invited by Parliament, they're here on Parliament's um, say-so. So it's really the beginning of the real shift of balance of power between the monarchy and Parliament. And I've brought in two gin bottles uh, on the left and the right because William is Dutch and he brings over this wonderful Dutch drink called Geneva, which really the English can't pronounce very well, and it becomes known as gin. And this will lead to a gin craze, which really doesn't take off until the early 18th century. A new map of London was commissioned as a result of um, William and Mary coming to the throne. There they are at the top. And look at this. There's Look how it's changed. Look at all this area particularly. Remember I said the area between the city and Westminster has all been filled in thanks to the development of Covent Garden and all of those squares. There's also been development, really, ribbon development out to the east of the city as well. And this area is known as Spitalfields. And actually in the 1680s, um, French Protestants were given refuge in London by Charles II um, and they settled here and they were very, very important because they were silk weavers and they brought the silk weaving industry to this area. And as a result of that, one in four Londoners today can claim having Huguenot blood 
running through their veins. Now we're nearly at the uh, the final um, few uh, minutes here. As a result of um, the fact that William and Mary have their powers limited by Parliament, they're not really interested in ruling from um, Westminster. Um, actually, William has asthma and he finds it very damp living next to the river. So Queen Mary has her eye on a little country house out to the west of London. This is Kensington Gardens to the west of London. And uh, she has her eye on this little house here. It's called Kens It's called Nottingham House. And she gets Christopher Wren, who doesn't ever stop working, to turn this into a royal residence. And it becomes Kensington Palace. And this is where William and Mary end up living with all that lovely fresh air. And as a result of that, it's the beginning of the development of fashionable Kensington, um, although that doesn't really take off until the 19th century. Not content with Kensington Palace, they go over to Hampton Court Palace, William and Mary. Now, Hampton Court, of course, had been built in the 16th century here um, and lived in by King Henry VIII. But they decide to um, add, add on and they build this section of Hampton Court Palace again in the classical Baroque style. Um, so now when you visit Hampton Court Palace, it's very much a palace of two halves. Um, and Mary, who is a very keen gardener and, of course, has been living in the Netherlands, introduces beautiful formal Dutch gardens to England. And you can still see the beautiful Dutch gardens um, laid out here at Hampton Court Palace. Um, also an orangery to keep the orange trees warm. Uh, now, they have the same idea that Charles II had, uh, giving a home to soldiers, except William and Mary want to give a home now to the disabled and injured sailors that have been fighting now wars against the French. During this time, um, William of Orange was constantly at war with Louis XIV of France. So they come over to Greenwich and they build this fantastic complex of buildings, which becomes a royal hospital for sailors. So this becomes known as the Royal Hospital Greenwich. Do you see there? That's the Queen's house that was built back in 1616 by Inigo Jones. Um, Queen Mary doesn't want the view from the Queen's house blocked by these buildings. So Christopher Wren had to split his uh, buildings into two sections. The chapel here on the left, where the sailors worshipped, and the dining hall here on the right, where the sailors had their meals. And we can still visit the interior of both of those buildings. This is the interior of the dining room of um, the Royal Hospital. Imagine the sailors eating their dinner in this magnificent hall. Um, the ceiling and the walls were painted by a man called James Thornhill, and it's become known as the Sistine Chapel of England. And right in the middle of that ceiling, we have a wonderful image of William and Mary ruling jointly together. So uh, that's a great and amazing interior to visit next time you're in London. Um, William and Mary die, uh, 1694, Mary dies, 1702, William dies, Queen Anne in 1702. Now, Queen Anne, um, we've, uh, we've, we've, we've come across a little bit more about her in recent years because of that film, The Favourite, with Olivia Coleman. Um, Queen Anne actually has two, we believe, love affairs, one with this lady on the left, Abigail uh, Masham, who was her maidservant, and this lady, Sarah Churchill, who was her very senior lady in waiting, and they both became lovers of Queen Anne. Um, now, Queen Anne only rules for 12 years, but she's very important. Um, she also likes ruling out of town, and she prefers meeting her ministers in private. In fact, she meets them in her private cabinet room, um, and today the senior ministers of the government are still known as the cabinet. And in 1707, she, um, she solidifies what James I had done with co-joining England and Scotland together as Great Britain, she now unifies the parliaments together in the Act of Union. So that's now where the parliaments are unified and 45 Scottish members of parliament arrive at Westminster. Uh, and well, if the current leader of the uh, Scottish Nationalist Party has her way in the next uh, three years, we might find that uh, Scotland separates again, of course. Um, one of the buildings that survives from Queen Anne's reign is this beautiful building which is on the Mall near Buckingham Palace, early 18th century, Christopher Wren again, he didn't stop. And this was actually built for Sarah Churchill, her, her lady friend. Um, and it's called Marlborough House because Sarah Churchill became the Duchess of Marlborough. And she was the ancestor of 
Churchill. Uh, that was used as a film location in The Crown, for those of you that uh, are fans of the television series. Now, we're nearly there, I promise. This is Queen Anne's Gate, this beautiful street in um, London, very close to Westminster Abbey. Another building act was passed in the reign of Queen Anne uh, to try and minimise fire risk. Um, up until uh, 1707, the window frames were actually flat against the brickwork. After 1707, the windows are recessed against the brickwork so that the fire, if it catches from the ground floor, can't leap up and catch onto the wooden frames at the top. Um, and um, you can just see there, I've just uh, illuminated the blue and the red there just to show you the difference. So you can actually, you can age the windows if you're so interested uh, by doing that. Um, now, one of the problems is that uh, as the suburbs of London grow, there's a worry there aren't enough churches. So in 1710, a commission was set up to build 50 new ones financed by a tax on coal. Um, sadly, the money ran out and only 12 of the 50 new churches actually were built. But here are four of the best and they're still with us. This is uh, the Church of St. Alphage in Greenwich. This is... Um, uh, St John's Church, which is in Westminster. This is Christ Church in Spitalfields. Uh, these were designed by Nicholas Hawksmoor, who was Christopher Wren's assistant. And this one, probably the most splendid of them all, is called um, St Mary Le Strand and um, designed by James Gibb. Um, and, and, you know, they're really reminiscent, aren't they, of sort of, you know, Venice or Rome. So again, this amazing um, classical uh, Italian architecture um, in London. And of course, in 1710, finally, Christopher Wren's fantastic uh, cathedral is finally completed. Um, there's the west front of it. Look at the interior of it. Um, and amazingly, Wren survived to see it. Um, and in fact, he, li he lived for 12 years after the fact. Once a week, he would go into the cathedral and look up the interior of that beautiful dome inspired by St. Peter's, but also the model, of course, for the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. Um, and um, after a weekly visit to the Dome, 12 years after it was finished, he caught a chill and died 91 years old. Uh, now, uh, one of the last acts of Queen Anne's reign was to officially open St Paul's Cathedral. As a result of that, they put a statue up in front of the cathedral. There it is. There's Queen Anne. Now, I'm afraid they poked fun at Queen Anne's statue. They said about Queen Anne, Brandy Nan, Brandy Nan left in the lurch. Back to uh, Brandy Nan, Brandy Nan left in the lurch, face to the gin shop and back to the church. I'm afraid Queen Anne was very fond of a drink, um, partly because she had a terrible life. She tried to secure an heir to the throne. 17 pregnancies Queen Anne had and all of her children died, um, either stillbirths or miscarriages. Uh, and one child died at the age of 11. So when she died in 1714, um, there were no surviving heirs. And the problem was that she had passed an act of parliament to say that no Roman Catholics could actually take the throne. Uh, and there were 50 Roman Catholics all lining up to take over, but they weren't allowed. So parliament had to cast the net a bit wider to find the next suitable Protestant heir to the throne. And they have to go all the way to Germany and they find the grandson of that Princess Elizabeth, all the way back to James I, and he is brought over in 1714, and the end of the Stuarts and the beginning of the Hanovers, the Georgians, begins. But I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, that's a story for another day. So with that in mind, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you kindly for your attention. I'm just going to put up my details there for you. Uh, again, London Walks details, walks.com slash London Virtual Tours. I'm Simon White, has London Blue Badge Guide. That's my email. That's my Twitter feed. That's my Instagram. Uh, you're welcome to grab uh, all of that. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention this afternoon. I'd like to thank Robert to have done it again, and I hope very much that you've enjoyed our time together. And I will... Well, yeah, uh, that, was, that was fabulous. Thank you. <laughs> that and I awesome. will take time uh, uh, if people have questions, or uh, I know there's probably lots of questions, uh, but um, far away. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. That was awesome. So, yeah, just a few quick updates. So we had a big turnout. We had um, over... 940 people were watching on Zoom. Oh, wow, amazing. And we have um, many more on Facebook. If you joined us late, um, we are recording this. And if all goes to plan, which it doesn't always with these recordings, we'll um, 
record it and share it on our YouTube page and I'll send the links out. And then a few weeks back, Simon did um, a medieval London tour, which was also really fascinating. If you haven't had a chance to see that, either the recording or the live session, I'll send that out as well. And you can check that out. And then let's see. So Simon was talking about Jamestown here in Virginia. And if you're in the mid-Atlantic area, we were actually in the process of planning a trip down there, a bus trip from Washington, D.C. to Jamestown for a day visit, um, and then COVID happened. So periodically our group in Washington, D.C., we go to different places that are like a day's drive away, like Gettysburg or the Harriet Tubman Museum, or we've been to Philadelphia and Richmond, et cetera, et cetera. So at some point in time when COVID ends, we'll end up going down to Jamestown. So you can start thinking about that. and then planning even further ahead, um, it would be great someday to organize a trip to London and have Simon show us around because he's a professional tour guide and an expert on the city and a blue badge tourist guide. So I would London, love to. And yeah, just London, remember all, all these buildings that you can visit, you know, today, all these buildings that are still there from this period. It's absolutely extraordinary. Yeah, well, that would be awesome. So we'll go see you in person someday once um, things start to return to normal. And then let's see a few other things. So Simon um, is also hosting a program called Love in London in two weeks. And I'll send out the information on that as well. If you want to join us, there's actually two different dates for that. Do you want to just maybe and give us like a 30 second overview, Simon, of what the Love in London tour is all about? Oh, love in London. Yes, it's a celebrate of all, all things to do with love in the capital. So we're going to talk about the origins of uh, uh, St. Valentine. We're going to go to the National Gallery and look at some beautiful works of art. We're going to look at lovers in art. We're going to be talking a little bit more about royal romances. We're going to be talking about Shakespeare and his wonderful sonnets. Um, we're going to be talking about the first marriage bureau that was set up in London uh, just at the outbreak of the Second World War, the original version of, you know, kind of, you know, Match.com today. Um, and um, yes, and, and we're going to look at some of the most romantic hotspots in, in the city. So it's going to be, you know, a bit of fun. It's going to be hopefully interesting and informative as well. Okay, so I'll send out the information. I posted a few people. I posted in the um, comment section in the Q&A when I was responding to people, but I'll also email yes. it out. So if you want to join us for that, I'm actually looking forward to attending that myself. And then, we, yeah, we did have quite a few questions. So speaking of um, romance, um, a question came in. So you talked about like different people and their um, affairs and whatnot, like Charles II and Gwyn. How, how, how did these uh, royalty meet these people? There wasn't Tinder and I'm sure they're not hanging out at Starbucks and it probably varies from person to person, but were there like certain ways that they were meeting these people that they were having affairs? Because it's not like the king can just kind of go roaming around the streets of London. Yeah, well, that's a very good question. Uh, yes. So in answer to the question, well, Charles II had already got, got mistresses um, in France. So, so when he was in exile at the court of Louis XIV, who was his cousin, by the way, so he was at Versailles, he already had got uh, aristocratic mistresses. So he'd already got those. So, they, so he brought those over with him. Now, Nell Gwynne, of course, was the actress who he, who he saw on the stage. So he saw her and invited her into the royal box, you know, and they went and had a bit of supper, you know, afterwards. And that's how he met Nell Gwynne. So, 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 so it's very unusual. Nell Gwynne was unusual in that she was a common, you know, she was a common girl. Um, I mean, her, her mother ran a brothel um, in, in, in Covent Garden, whereas all the other mistresses were actually aristocrats. And let's not forget, of course, that the history of royal mistresses goes <laughs> right the way through until, you know, um, <laughs> the 20th and possibly even the 21st century, possibly. Which we'll discuss more in two weeks. <laughs> that's another. That's another. It's a discussion for another time. Yes. Okay. And then Eve asked a good question. He said, "Here in the United States, the Mayflower arrival is a really big deal. But what about in the UK? Is it just like a footnote to history, or is it like an important date? How's what's the kind of collection there?" Well, I think for us, of course, it's yes, it's, it's of course, it's a much bigger, obviously, event in the US. I mean, for, for us, I think, I mean, the last year it, we did do a big sort of, you know, um, 400 year um, celebration. Um, I mean, we, uh, of course, I mean, I, th I think it's, you know, children are taught about it at school, but it's, it's not a huge thing. Okay. Um, but it's, but it, I think people don't realize the legacy of the Mayflower and the fact that the, the captain is buried in that churchyard. Um, and, and we do have another statue to the Mayflower a little bit further along the river, actually. And then someone asked, what was the name again of that um, gruesome operation <laughs> you were describing? I didn't know if they, that's something that they wanted to look into for themselves or they just wanted to do more. Oh yes, if you want to do further research, um, <laughs> um, uh, it's called a lithotomy. How do you spell that? A, a, lith, a lithotomy. Okay. And, then another and, you, and, you, and you wanted a really quick surgeon. Uh, 
you wanted the fastest surgeon you could get your hands on to, to perform it. Um, let's see. And then another good question. Someone asked, are there any movies that you recommend that kind of describe more this um, period that you've been discussing, like any particular movies that you like to, that are, talk about this area or cover this area era? Oh, goodness. Well, yes. Let me think for a second. Well, th th there, I mean, there are a few older movies. There's a really great movie about Charles I um, and the execution of Charles I and his uh, starring Alec Guinness, um, which I think is from the 1970s. And I think it's called. Oh, I think it's actually called Cromwell, I think. And it stars Richard Harris, who's another wonderful actor dead now, uh, who plays Cromwell. So that's a good movie about the Cromwellian sort of uh, Charles I. Uh, let me just think. Um, well, if you haven't seen The Favourite, of course, um, that focuses on, on the reign of Queen Anne, um, which is a very quirky and, and, and brilliant film. Um, uh, what, what else can I think of? I don't know if anyone else can, can think of any off the top of my head. Um, those are the two I can really think of. Okay. And then what about another question? So we have a lot of people that have not been to London before that are on this um, presentation and was there is there something like in particular when people visit London for the first time that surprises them the most or that they weren't expecting anything as you talk to people from this various places that come to the city that shocks them the most or surprises them the most? Um, I think people are really amazed at the variety of architecture. I think that really uh, wows people um, and I think also what surprises people and I, in a way it it, it, it was all set up during this era and maybe even a little bit before this era. But the fact is, you know, London has everything. It's, it's like, you know, not only do we, you know, the financial district, it's the heart of the financial district. Uh, the theatre is concentrated in London. You know, royalty lives in London. You know, you know, most other countries, you know, those things would be divided up in, in, in other cities. I mean, like in the US, you have, you know, uh, the political capital, obviously, in DC and the financial district in, in New York. Whereas everything's in London. So I think people get surprised by that. Um, yeah, and also there's a lot of stuff in Los Angeles, like as far as entertainment. Um, and of course, Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Hollywood. Uh -huh. I think, yeah. by the way, people will be very pleasantly surprised if you haven't been to London or you haven't been to London in a long time. Uh, the, 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 the food is, the restaurant culture is fantastic here. Whereas even 20 years ago, you know, we were not known for our food. But boy, oh boy, we have 60 Michelin star restaurants right now. Uh, we're one of the food capitals of, of, um, of the world. Okay. And then someone else, um, Jennifer, said that she signed up for, she says, I watched the medieval program. I loved it. I watched the one today. I loved it. I'm signed up for the Valentine's one. What other programs do you do about London history, she asks. Uh, well, thank you. thank you, Jennifer, for asking. And anybody else? Well, if you go to walks.com, if you uh, the, the website there, um, that will list. Um, so my virtual tours are on that site um, uh, and all the other virtual tours that, you know, many of my colleagues offer as well. Um, uh, so, so Valentine's next. And, and I'm planning on doing um, a, 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 an art series and then and possibly I don't know whether uh, perhaps we'll collaborate again, Robert. I don't know. With oh, another of course one of we will. Um, <laughs> Tell so, us about the art series because you and I talked about that um, a couple weeks ago but for the people that um, just tell can you give us well, uh, so, so my plan is it's going to be called art in London and and it's going to be a chance really to look at um, all of our wonderful sort of you know museums and galleries but doing it sort of chronologically so we're going to be looking at the again the, the medieval period the renaissance uh, the, the baroque and the rococo era the 19th century and probably into the 20th century so I think it's going to be a four or five part of series um, and uh, uh, it is going to happen. I just have to get it launched. So <laughs> probably, probably by the end of February, early March, it's going to be um, it's going to be out there. Yeah. Um, and, and also, the by the way, we're also doing London Walks is doing a series on 20th century London, um, which, uh, in fact, I'm doing an episode of that tonight. Um, uh, starting with we did the Edwardian era. We did the interwar period. We're doing the Second World War tonight. And then we're going right up until the present day. Uh, so that's something people could join if they wanted to. Um, yeah. Wait, wait, yeah. So what's the one that you're hosting tonight? And what it's time called, is uh, it? It's at seven o'clock tonight, uh, uh, London time. And it's called, uh, uh, well, it's London 1939 to 1945. So it concentrates on the, the period of the Second World War. Okay, well, here's what I'll do. Um, let me see if I can email that out to everyone. Oh, actually, I have to say, I've got a feeling that it might, we, we might be at capacity for that. So you oh, might yeah, not be able to. Okay, well then, I'll, yes. um, we'll do that maybe someday in the future. <laughs> but we are gonna re, but we are gonna rerun it. So uh, okay. we are gonna rerun oh, it. So, so we can definitely alert people to, to when we're rerunning it. Okay, that would be terrific. Okay, um, let's see. So we have a lot of other questions, but I wanna stay here um, forever. So why don't we cut this off and we'll 
uh, resume again at some point in time in the future. But thank you again so much, Simon. That was really awesome. There was, you can't see the comments, there's all these people. I live in London, I learned so much and, and I've visited Great. many times and I've learned things I never knew. So And do feel free, please, please get in touch with me if you want to. Drop me an email if you have any questions, um, you know, feel free. Um, that'd be great. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you, Simon. That was brilliant. Appreciate that. Thank you. It's so my much. pleasure. Lovely and to again. be with you again, Robert. Oh, great. And then and, again, oh, I think I'll people just... had a question about if people wanted to get in touch with me. Um, uh, I know sometimes people want to say thank you afterwards. Uh, they can either do that, I think, via you, Robert. That's correct. Um, yeah, they can, or they can um, email directly to you. And you should follow Simon on Twitter and Instagram, like I do. So good to see what he has going on in the city. Yes. Uh, and you can contact me, yeah, I say via email directly um, if you want to. Okay, awesome. Oh, and then you can also, um, let's see, if someone wants to send you a tip, can they do, you You accept PayPal through your email? Oh, well, if anybody wants to, that would be very kind. But yes, uh, the only way to do it actually is via PayPal. And all you would need to do is to send it to my email address, which is there, bbgsimon at gmail.com. I know some people try to send things via other apps, which I don't have set up at the moment. So my apologies if I if I didn't pick up on those, but PayPal via email is the way to do it. Um, oh, and I'll email that out as well. So, okay, awesome. Well, thanks, Well, Simon. have a happy uh, rest of the day, everyone. A happy weekend. Uh, thank you for joining again. Thank you, Robert. Um, and look forward to seeing you all again another time. Yeah, and cheers. And cheers. Take care, everyone. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank you.